Good evening. Although I have given many lectures about 9-11, I had, prior to this one, never devoted an entire lecture to simply summarizing what I take to be the strongest evidence against the official account of 9-11. Although I'm a philosopher of religion and a theologian, I've spent most of my time the last three years working on 9-11, studying it, writing about it, talking about it. In this lecture, I will try to make clear why I have devoted so much time and energy to this topic. I will do so in terms of the distinction between myth and reality. I'm here using the term myth in two senses. In one sense, a myth is an idea that, while widely believed, is false, does not correspond with reality. In a deeper sense, which is employed by students of religion, a myth serves as an orienting and mobilizing story for a people, a story that reminds them who they are and why they do what they do. When a story is called a myth in this sense, which can be called myth with a capital M, the focus is not on the story's relation to reality, but on its function. This orienting and mobilizing function is possible because the myth in this sense has uh, a religious overtone. It is a sacred story. However, although to note that a, that a story functions as a myth in the religious sense is not to say anything about its truth, a story cannot function this way unless it is believed to be true in the community or the nation. It is not a matter of debate. If some people have the bad taste to raise the question of the truth of the sacred story, the keepers of the faith do not enter into debate with them. They ignore them or denounce them as blasphemers. It is wrong, blasphemous, and sinful for you to suggest, imply, or help other people come to the conclusion that the U.S. government killed 3,000 of its own citizens. According to the official story about 9-11, America, because of its goodness, was attacked by fanatical Arab Muslims who hate our freedoms. This story has clearly functioned as a sacred myth since that fateful day. And this function appears to have been closely, carefully orchestrated. The very next day, President Bush announced his intention to lead a monumental struggle of good versus evil. Then on September 13, he declared the following day would be a national day of prayer and remembrance for the victims of the terrorist attacks. And on that next day, the president himself, surrounded by Billy Graham, a cardinal, a rabbi, and an imam, delivered a sermon in the National Cathedral, saying, Our responsibility to history is already clear, to answer these attacks and rid the world of evil. War has been waged against us by stealth and deceit and murder. This nation is peaceful, but fierce when stirred to anger. In every generation, the world has produced enemies of human freedom. They have attacked America because we are freedom's home and defender. And the commitment of our fathers is now the calling of our time. We ask Almighty God to watch over our nation and grant us patience and resolve in all that is to come. And may he always guide our country. God bless America. Through this unprecedented event, in which the President of the United States issued a declaration of war from a cathedral, French author Terry Maison observed in 2002, the American government consecrated its version of the events from then on, any questioning of the official truth would be seen as sacrilege. That attitude has remained dominant in the public sphere until this day, as the official account has continued to serve as a sacred story. When people raise questions about this story, they are either ignored, ridiculed as conspiracy theorists, or, as Charlie Sheen has recently learned, personally attacked. When anyone asks what right the administration has to invade and occupy other countries, to imprison people indefinitely without due process, or even to ignore various laws, the answer is always the same, 9-11. Those who believe that U.S. law and international law should be respected are dismissed as having a pre-9-11 mindset. Given the role that the official account of 9-11 has played, the most important question before our country today 
is whether this account, besides being a myth in the religious sense, is also a myth in the pejorative sense. That is, it is simply false. As a philosopher of religion, I would emphasize that the fact that a story has served as a religious myth does not necessarily main, mean that it fails to correspond with reality. Many religious accounts have at least a kernel of truth that can be defended in rational debate. In many cases, however, stories that have served as religious myths cannot stand up to rational scrutiny. When such a story is stripped of its halo and treated simply as a theory rather than an unquestionable dogma, it cannot be defended as the best theory to account for the relevant evidence. The official account of 9-11 is such a theory. When challenges to it are not treated as blasphemy, it can easily be seen to be co composed of a number of ideas that are myths in the sense of not corresponding with reality. Using the word myth from now on only in this pejorative sense, I will discuss nine of the major myths contained in the official story about 9-11. I will thereby show that the official account cannot be defended in light of the relevant evidence against the main alternative account according to which 9-11 was an inside job orchestrated by people within our own government. I will begin by looking at a few myths that prevent many people from even looking at this evidence. Myth number one, our political and military leaders simply would not do such a thing. This idea is widely believed, but it is undermined by much evidence. The United States, like many other countries, has often used deceit to begin wars. For example, the American-Mexican uh, War, with its false claim that Mexico had shed American blood on American soil. The Spanish-American War, with its remember the main incidents. The war in the Philippines, with its false claim that the Filipinos fired the first shot. And the Vietnam War, with its Gulf of Tonk Tonkin hoax. The U.S. government has also sometimes organized false flag terrorist attacks, killing innocent civilians, then blaming the attacks on an enemy country or group, often by planning evidence. As Daniel Ganser has shown in his recent book, NATO's Secret Armies, NATO guided by the CIA and the Pentagon, arranged many such attacks in Western European countries during the Cold War in which hundreds of people were killed by bombs or hooded men with shotguns. These attacks were successfully blamed on communists and other leftists to discredit them in the eyes of the voting public. Finally, if it be thought that the U.S. military would not orchestrate such attacks against American citizens, one needs only to read the plans known as Operation Northwoods, which the Joint Chiefs of Staff worked up in 1962, shortly after Fidel Castro had overthrown the pro-American dictator Batista. This plan contained various pretexts which would provide justification for U.S. military in intervention in Cuba. Some of them would have involved killing Americans. For example, I remember the main incident we could blow up a ship, a U.S. ship in Guantanamo Bay, and blame Cuba. At this point, some people, having seen evidence that U.S. leaders would be morally capable of orchestrating 9-11, might avoid looking at the evidence by appeal to myth number two. Our political and military leaders would have had no motive for orchestrating the 9-11 attacks. This myth wa was reinforced by the 9-11 Commission while explaining why Al why that Al-Qaeda had ample motives for carrying out the attacks, this report mentions no motives that U.S. leaders might have had. But the alleged motives of Al-Qaeda, that it hated America and their, Americans and their freedoms, is dwarfed by a motive held by many members of the Bush-Cheney administration, the dream of establishing a global Pax Americana, the first all-inclusive empire in history. This dream has been articulated by many neoconservatives or neocons during the 1990s after the disintegration of the Soviet Union made it seem possible. It was first officially articulated in the defense planning guidance of 1992 drafted by Paul Wolfowitz on behalf of then Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney, a document that has been called a blueprint for permanent American global hegemony and Cheney's plan to rule the world. 
Achieving this goal would require four things. One of these was getting control of the world's oil, especially in Central Asia and the Middle East. And the Bush administration came to power with plans already made to attack Afghanistan and Iraq. The second requirement was a technological transformation of the military in which fighting from space would become central. A third requirement was an enormous increase in military spending to pay for these new wars and the weaponization of space. The fourth need was to modify the doctrine of preemptive attack so that America would be able to attack other countries even if they uh, presented no imminent threat. These four elements would require a fifth, an event that would make the American people ready to accept these imperialistic policies. As the big new Brzezinski explained in his 1997 book, The Grand Chessboard, the American people with their democratic instincts are reluctant to authorize the money and human sacrifice as necessary for imperial mobilization. And this refusal limits America's capacity for military intimidation. But this imped impediment could be overcome if there were a truly massive and widely perceived direct external threat, just as the American people were willing to enter World War II only after the shock effect of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The same idea was suggested in a 2000 document entitled Rebuilding America's Defenses, which was put out by a neocon think tank called the Project for the New American Century many members of which, including Cheney, Rumsfeld, and Wolfowitz, became central members of the Bush administration. This document, referring to the goal of transforming the military, said that this process of transformation is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. When the attacks of 9-11 occurred, they were treated like a new Pearl Harbor, Several members of the administration spoke of them as opportunities. Secretary of Rump Defense Rumsfeld said that 9-11 created the kind of opportunities that World War II offered to refashion the world. It created in particular the opportunity to attack Afghanistan and Iraq, to increase the military budget enormously, to go forward with military transformation, and to turn the new idea of preemptive warfare into official doctrine. This doctrinal, ch doctrinal change was announced in the 2002 version of the National Security Strategy, which said that America will act against emerging threats before they are fully formed. So not only did the Bush administration reap huge benefits from 9-11, these were benefits that it had desired in advance. The idea that it would have had no motives for orchestrating 9-11 is a myth. But there is one more myth that keeps many people from looking at the evidence. This is myth number three. Such a big operation involving so many people could not have been kept a secret because someone involved in it would have talked by now. This claim is based on a more general myth, which is that it is impossible for secret government operations to be kept secret very long because someone always talks. But how could one know this? If some big operations have remained secret until now, we, by definition, don't know about them. <laughs> Moreover, we do know about some big operations that were kept secret as long as necessary, such as the Manhattan Project to create the atomic bomb, and the war in Indonesia in 1957, which the United States provoked, participated in, and then kept secret until 1995. Many more examples could be given. We can understand, moreover, why those with inside knowledge of 9-11 would not talk. At least most of them would have been people with the proven ability to keep secrets. Those who were directly complicit would also be highly motivated to avoid public disgrace and the gas chamber. <laughs> those people who had knowledge without being complicit could be induced to keep quiet by means of more or less subtle threats, such as, Joe, if you go forward with your plan to talk to the press, I don't know who is going to protect your wife and kids from some nutcase angered by your statement. Still another fact is that neither the government nor the mainstream press has, to say the least, shown any signs of wanting people to come forward. For all these reasons, it is not surprising that no one has. I move to myth number four, 
The 9-11 Commission, which has endorsed the official account, was an independent, impartial commission and hence can be believed. One needs only to look at the reviews of the 9-11 Commission report on Amazon.com to see that this assumption is widely held. Perhaps this is because in the preface, the Commission's chairman and co vice chairman tell us that the Commission sought to be independent, impartial, thorough, and nonpartisan. But these terms do not describe the reality. The Commission's lack of impartiality can be explained partly by the fact that Chairman Thomas Kane, most of the other commissioners, and at least half of the members of the staff had serious conflicts of interest. The most serious problem, however, is that the executive director, Philip Zelikow, was essentially a member of the Bush-Cheney administration. He had worked with Condoleezza Rice on the National Security Council in the administration of the first President Bush. Then when the Republicans were out of office, he and Condoleezza Rice wrote a book together. Then when she was named National Security Advisor for the second President Bush, she brought him on to help with the transition. Finally then, he was appointed to the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. So he was the, the White House's man inside the 9-11 Commission. And yet, as Executive Director, he guided the staff, which did virtually all the work. Zelico was in position, therefore, to decide which topics would be investigated and which ones not. One disgruntled staff member reportedly said at the time, Zelikow is calling the shots, he's skewing the investigation, and running it his own way. Accordingly, the commission was not independent from the executive branch. Insofar as the commission was supposed to be investigating the failure of the Bush administration to prevent the attacks, the commission was no more independent and impartial than if Dick Cheney had been running it. <laughs> the only difference was that no one was shot. <laughs> Zelikow's ideological and personal closeness to the Bush administration is further shown by one more fact that until now has not been widely known, even within the 9-11 Truth Movement. I mentioned earlier the Bush administration's National Security Strategy Statement of 2002, in which the new doctrine of preemptive warfare was articulated. The primary author of this document, reports James Mann in Rise of the Vulcans, was none other than Philip Zelikow. According to Mann, after Rice saw a first draft, which had been written by Richard Haas in the State Department, she wanted something bolder and brought in Philip Zelikow to completely rewrite the document. The result was a document that used 9-11 to justify a very bellicose foreign policy. We can understand, therefore, why the Commission, under Zelikow's leadership, would have ignored all the evidence that would point to the truth, that 9-11 was a false flag operation intended to authorize the doctrines and funds needed for a new level of imperial mobilization. The suggestion that 9-11 was a false flag operation brings us to myth number five. The Bush administration provided proof that the attacks were carried out by al-Qaeda terrorists under the direction of Osama bin Laden. One of the main pieces of alleged proof involved the claim that the baggage of a Mohammed Atta called the ringleader was discovered at the Boston airport from which Flight 11 departed. This baggage, besides containing Atta's passport and driver's license, also contained various types of incriminating evidence, such as flight simulator manu manuals, videotapes of Boeing airliners, and a letter to other hijackers about preparing for the mission. But the bags also contained Ada's will. Why would Ada have intended to take his will on a flight he planned to fly into the World Trade Center? There are also many other problems with this story. We seem to have planted evidence. Another element of the official story about the alleged hijackers is that they were very devout Muslims. The 9-11 Commission report said that Ada had become very religious, even fanatically so. The public was thereby led to believe that these men would have no problem with a suicide mission because they were ready to meet their maker. But investigator reporter Daniel Hopsicker discovered that Ada loved cocaine, alcohol, gambling, pork, and lap dances. <laughs> Several of the other alleged hijackers had similar taste reported the Wall Street Journal. The Commission pretends, however, that none of this information was available. While admitting that Ada met other members of Al-Qaeda in Las Vegas shortly before 9-11, 
It says that it saw no credible evidence explaining why, on this occasion and others, the operatives flew to or met in Las Vegas. Another problem in the official account is that although we are told that five, four or five of the alleged hijackers were on each of the flights, no proof of this claim has been provided. The story, of course, is that they did not force their way onto the planes, but they bought tickets. If so, their names should have been on the flight manifest. But the flight manifests that have been released contain neither the names of the alleged hijackers nor any Arab names whatsoever. We have also been given no proof that the remains of any of these men were found in the wreckage. One final little problem is that several of these 19 men, according to stories published by the BBC and British newspapers, are still alive. For example, the 9-11 Commission named Walid al-Shiri as one of the hijackers and re reproduced the FBI's photograph of him. It even suggested that al-Shiri stabbed one of the flight attendants shortly before Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower. But as BBC News had reported ten, 11 days after 9-11, al-Shiri, having seen his photograph in newspapers and TV programs, notified authorities and journalists in Morocco, where he works as his pilot, that he was still alive. But if there are various problems with the government's story about the hijackers, surely it proved its case about Osama bin Laden. And so far as this belief is held, it is also a myth. Secretary of State Colin Powell promised shortly after 9-11 to provide a white paper giving this proof. But this paper was never produced. British Prime Minister Tony Blair did produce such a paper, but it begins with the admission that it does not purport to provide a prosecutable case against Osama bin Laden in a court of law. So, evidence good enough to go to war, but not good enough to go to court. <laughs> and although the Taliban said that it would hand bin Laden over if the United States presented evidence of his involvement in 9-11, Bush refused. This failure to provide proof was later said to be unnecessary because bin Laden, in a video allegedly found in Afghanistan, admitted responsibility for the attacks. This confession is now widely cited as proof. But the man in this video has darker skin, fuller cheeks, and a broader nose than the Osama bin Laden of all other videos. We again seem to have planted evidence. There are, moreover, other problems in the official account of Osama bin Laden. For one thing, in June of 2001, when he was already America's most wanted criminal, he reportedly spent two weeks in the American hospital in Dubai, was treated by an American doctor, and visited by the local CIA agent. Also, after 9-11, when America was reportedly trying to get Osama dead or alive, the U.S. military evidently allowed him to escape on at least four occasions, the last one being the Battle of Tora Bora, which the London Telegraph labeled a grand charade. Shortly thereafter, Bush said, I don't know where bin Laden is. I really don't care. It's not our priority. <laughs> Sometimes the truth slips out. <laughs> In any case, the idea that the Bush administration has provided proof for its claims about Osama bin Laden and the Al-Qaeda hijackers is a myth. I turn now to myth number six. The 9-11 attacks came as a surprise to the Bush administration. Nothing is more essential to the official story than this idea. About 10 months after 9-11, FBI Director Robert Mueller said, to this day, we have found no one in the United States except the actual hijackers who knew of the plot. There is much evidence, however, that counts against this claim. One type of evidence involves an extraordinarily high volume of put options purchased in the three days prior to 9-11. To buy put options for a particular company is to bet that its stock price will go down. These extraordinary purchases included two and only two airlines, United and American, the two airlines used in the attacks. They also included Morgan Stanley Dean Witter, which occupied 22 stories of the World Trade Center. The price of these shares did, of course, plummet after 9-11, resulting in enormous profits for the pur purchasers. These unusual purchases, as the San Francisco Chronicle said, raised suspicions that the investors had advanced knowledge of the strikes. It would appear, in other words, that those who made the purchases knew that United and American airliners were going to be used in attacks on the World Trade Center. 
The 9-11 Commission tried to show these suspicions to be unfounded. It claimed, for example, that the purchases for United Airlines do not show anyone other than Al-Qaeda had foreknowledge because 95% of these options were purchased by a single U.S.-based institutional investor with no conceivable ties to Al-Qaeda. <laughs> but the Commission thereby simply begged the question at issue, which is whether some organization other than Al-Qaeda was involved in the planning. <laughs> also, the Commission ignored the other crucial point, which is that U.S. intelligence agency closely monitored the stock market looking for any anomalies that pro might provide clues to untoward events. Therefore, regardless of who orchestrated the attacks, the U.S. government would have had intelligence suggesting that United and American airliners were to be used for attacks on the World Trade Center in the near future. Further evidence of advanced knowledge is shown by the behavior of President Bush and his Secret Service agents at the photo op at the school in Florida that morning. According to the official story, when Bush was first told that a plane had struck one of the Twin Towers, he dismissed the incident as a horrible accident, which meant that they could go ahead with the photo op. News of the second strike, however, would have indicated, assuming that the strikes were unexpected, that terrorists were using planes to attack high-value targets and what could have been a higher-value target than the President of the United States. His location at the school had been more highly publicized. Therefore, the Secret Service agent should have feared that a hijacked airliner might have been bearing down on the school at that very minute, ready to crash into it. It is standard procedure for the Secret Service to rush the President to a safe location whenever there is any sign of danger. And yet these agents allowed the President to remain another half hour at the school, even permitting him to deliver an address on TV thereby announcing to the world that he was still at the school. Would not this behavior be explainable only if the head of the Secret Service detail knew that the planned attacks did not include an attack on the President? The 9-11 Commission, of course, did not ask this question. It was content to report that the Secret Service told us they did not think it imperative for the President to run out the door. Maintaining decorum, in other words, was more important than protecting the President's life. Can anyone serious believe, seriously believe that the highly trained Secret Service would act this way in a situation of genuine danger? A third example. A Pentagon spokesperson, in explaining why the Pentagon was not evacuated before it was struck, claimed that the Pentagon was simply not aware that this aircraft was coming our way. <laughs> the 9-11 Commission claimed that there was no warning about an unidentified aircraft heading towards Washington until 9.36, and hence only one or two minutes before the Pentagon was struck. But this claim is contradicted by Secretary of Transportation Norman Mineta's testimony about an episode that occurred in the Presidential Emergency Operations Center under the White House. In open testimony to the 9-11 Commission itself, Mineta said, During, During the, the time that the airplane coming in to the Pentagon uh, there was a young man who would come in and say to the vice president, the, the plane is 50 miles out, the plane is 30 miles out. And when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, uh, the young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to, to the, the contrary? contrary? Mineta said that this conversation occurred at 9.25 or 9.26, hence many minutes before the Pentagon was struck. This example gives us one of the clearest examples of the fact that the Zelikow-led 9-11 Commission cannot be trusted. Having claimed that there was no knowledge that an aircraft was approaching the Pentagon until the last minute or so, it simply omitted Mineta's testimony to the contrary. Then, to rule out the possibility that the episode Mineta had reported could have occurred, it claimed that Cheney did not even arrive down at the Presidential Emergency Operations Center until almost 10 o'clock, hence about 20 minutes after the Pentagon was struck. 
But this claim, besides contradicting Mineta's eyewitness testimony that Cheney was already there when Mineta arrived at 9.20, also contradicts all other reports as to when Cheney had arrived there, including a report by Cheney himself. <laughs> In sum, having compared the official stories about the put options, the Secret Service, and Mineta's testimony, we can reject as a myth the idea that the attacks were unexpected. However, even if the attacks had been unexpected, should they not have been prevented? This brings us to myth number seven. U.S. officials have explained why the hijacked airliners were not intercepted. Actually, there is a sense in which this claim is true. U.S. officials have explained why the U.S. military did not present, prevent the attacks. The problem, however, is that they have given us three explanations. They are all mutually contradictory, and none of them is a satisfactory explanation. I will explain. According to standard operating procedures, if an FAA flight controller notices anything that suggests a possible hijacking, the controller is to contact a superior. If the problem cannot be fixed quickly, within about a minute, the superior is to ask NORAD, the North American Aerospace Command, to send up or scramble jet fighters to find out what is going on. NORAD then issues a scramble order to the nearest Air Force base with fighters on alert. The jet fighters at NORAD's disposal could respond very quickly. According to the U.S. Air Force website, F-15s can go from scramble order to 29,000 feet in only two and a half minutes after which they can fly over 1,800 miles an hour. Therefore, according to General Ralph Eberhardt, the head of NORAD, after the FAA senses that something is wrong, it takes about a minute for it to contact NORAD, after which, according to a spokesperson, NORAD can scramble fighter jets within a matter of minutes to anywhere in the United States. An Air Force traffic control document put out in 1988 warn pilots that any airplanes persisting in unusual behavior will likely find two jet fighters on their tail within 10 or so minutes. If these procedures had been carried out on the morning of 9-11, American Airlines Flight 11 and United Flight 175 would have been intercepted before they could have reached Manhattan. And American Flight 77 would have been intercepted long before it could have reached the Pentagon. Such interceptions are routine, being carried out about 100 times a year. A month after 9-11, the Calgary Herald reported that in the year 2000, NORAD has scrambled fighters 129 times. Do these scrambles often result in interceptions? Just a few days after 9-11, Major Mike Snyder, a NORAD spokesperson, told the Boston Globe that NORAD's fighters routinely intercept aircraft. Why did not such interceptions occur on 9-11? During the first few days, the public was told that no fighter jets were sent up until after the strike on the Pentagon at 9:38. However, it was also reported that signs of Flight 11's hijacking had been observed at 8:15. That would mean that although interceptions usually occur within 10 or so minutes after signs of trouble are observed, in this case, 80 or so minutes had elapsed before fighters were even airborne. This story suggested that a stand-down order had been given. Within a few days, however, a second story was put out, according to which NORAD had sent fighters up, but because notification from the FAA had been very tardy, the fighters arrived too late. On September 18th, NORAD made this second story official, embodying it in a timeline which indicated when NORAD had been uh, notified by the FAA about each airplane and when it had scrambled fighters in response. Cr critics quickly showed, however, that even if the FAA notifications had come as late as NORAD's timeline indicated, NORAD's jets would have had time to make interceptions. The second story did not, therefore, remove the suspicion that a stand-down order had been given. Hoping to overcome this problem, the 9-11 Commission report provided a third account, according to which, contrary to NORAD's timeline of September 18th, the FAA did not notify NORAD about Flight 175 until it, after it had struck the South Tower, 
or about Flight 77 until after it had struck the Pentagon. But there are three big problems with this third story. One problem is the very fact that it is the third story. Normally, when a suspect in a criminal investigation keeps changing his story, we get suspicious. Let's say that the police asked Charlie Jones where he was on the night of a particular crime. He says he was at the movie theater. But they say, no, the movie theater has been closed all week. Oh, Charlie says, that's right, I was with my girlfriend. No, the police say, we checked with her and she was home with her husband. <laughs> at that point, Charlie says, oh, now I remember, I was home reading the Bible. <laughs> You're probably not going to believe Charlie. <laughs> and yet that's what we have here. The military told one story right after 9-11, another story a week later, and a third through the 9-11 Commission report in 2004. The second problem with this third story is that it contradicts several features of the second story, which had served as the official story for almost three years. For example, NORAD's timeline had indicated that the FAA had notified it about Flight 175 20 minutes before the South Tower was struck and notified it about Flight 77 at least 14 minutes before the Pentagon was struck. The 9-11 Commission maintains that both of these statements were incorrect, that really there had been no notification that the, about these flights until after they hit their targets. This is why the military failed to intercept them. But if NORAD's timeline was false, as the Commission now claims, NORAD must have been either lying or confused. But it is hard to believe that it could have been confused one week after 9-11. So it must have been lying. But if NORAD was lying then, why should we believe them now? Further skepticism about this third story arises from the fact that it is contradicted by considerable evidence. For example, the Commission's claim that the military did not know about Flight 175 until it reached its goal is contradicted by a report by Captain Michael Jelinek, who on 9-11 was overseeing NORAD's headquarters in Colorado. According to a story in the Toronto Star, uh, Jelinek is a Canadian, Jelinek was on the phone with NORAD as he watched Flight 175 crash into the South Tower. He then asked NORAD, was that the hijacked aircraft you were dealing with? To which NORAD said, yes. The 9-11 Commission's claims about Flight 175 and 77 are also contradicted by a memo sent to the Commission by Laura Brown of the FAA. Her memo stated that the FAA had set up a teleconference at about 8.50 that morning, which it start, at, at which time it started sharing information about all flights with the military. She specifically mentioned Flight 77. Her memo, which is available on the web, was discussed by the Commission and read into its record on May 23, 2003. But Zelokow's 9-11 Commission report fails to mention this memo. Because of these and still more problems, which I have discussed in a lecture called Flights of Fancy, this third story does not remove the grounds for suspicion that a stand-down order had been given. There is, moreover, ear witness testimony for this suspicion an upper management official at LAX, who, remain, who needs to remain anonymous, told me that he overheard members of LAX security, including officers from the FBI and the LAPD, interacting on their walkie-talkies shortly after the attacks. In some cases, he could hear both sides of the conversation. At first, the LAX officials were furious because they were told that the airplanes that attacked the World Trade Center and the Pentagon had not been intercepted because the FAA had not notified NORAD about the hijackings. But later, he reports, they were even more furious because they were told that NORAD had been notified but did not respond because it had been ordered to stand down. When LAX security officials asked who had issued that order, they were told that it came from the highest level of the White House. That, of course, would mean Cheney. <laughs> Accordingly, the idea that the attacks could not have been prevented is a myth. 
To move to myth number eight, official reports have explained why the Twin Towers and Building 7 of the World Trade Center collapsed. This claim suffers from the same problem as the previous one. We have had three explanations, each of which contradicts the others, and none of which is anywhere near adequate. The first explanation, widely disseminated through television specials, was that the buildings collapsed because their steel columns were melted by the jet fuel fed fires. But this explanation contained many problems, the most obvious of which is that steel does not begin to melt until about 2800 degrees Fahrenheit, while open fires based on hydrocarbons such as kerosene, which is what jet fuel is, cannot, even under the most ideal circumstances, rise above 1700 degrees. A second explanation, endorsed by the 9-11 Commission report, is a pancake theory, according to which the fires, while not melting the steel, heated it up sufficiently to cause the floors weakened by the airplane strikes to break loose from the steel columns, both those in the core and those around the outside. All the floors above the strike zone hence fell down on the floor below the strike zone, causing it to break free, and this started a chain reaction so that the floors pancaked all the way down. But this explanation also suffered from many problems, the most obvious of which was that it could not exp explain why the buildings collapsed into a pile of rubble only a few stories high. The core of each of the Twin Towers consisted of 47 massive steel columns. If the floors had broken loose from them, these columns would have still been sticking up into the air a thousand feet. The 9-11 Commission report tried to cover up this problem by claiming that the core of each tower consisted of a hollow steel shaft. But those massive steel columns could not be wished away. The definitive explanation was supposed to be a third one, issued by the National Institute for Standards and Technology, usually called NIST. The NIST report claimed that when the floors collapsed, they, rather than breaking free from the columns, pulled on them, causing the perimeter columns to become unstable. This instability then increased the gravity load on the core columns, which had been weakened by tremendously hot fires in the core, which NIST claims reached over 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. And this combination of factors resulted in global collapse. But as physicists Jim Hoffman and Stephen Jones have shown, this account is riddled with problems. One of these is that NIST's claim about the tremendously hot fires in the core is completely unsupported by the evidence or logic. A second problem is that even if this sequence of events had occurred, NIST provided no explanation as to why it would have produced global, that is total, collapse. The NIST report, uh, report asserts that column failure occurred in the core as well as the perimeter columns, but this remains a bare assertion. There is no plausible explanation of why the core columns would have broken or even buckled so as to produce global collapse. And this is only to begin to enumerate the problems in this theory, all of which follow from the fact that it, like the previous two theories, is essentially a fire theory, according to which the buildings were brought down primarily by fire. In the case of the Twin Towers, of course, the impact of the airplanes is said to have played a role. But most experts who support the official theory attribute the collapses primarily to the fire. NIST, for example, says that the main contribution of the airplanes, aside from providing jet fuel, was to dislodge a lot of the fireproofing from the steel, thereby, thereby making it vulnerable to the fires. By the way, when you go home tonight and light your fire in your fireplace, be sure to fireproof your steel, or the grate may collapse. <laughs> These fire theories face several formidable problems. First, the fires in these three buildings were not very hot, very big, or very long-lasting compared with fires in some steel frame high-rises that did not collapse. A 1991 fire in Philadelphia burned 18 hours, and a 2004 fire in Caracas burned 17 hours without causing even a partial collapse. By contrast, the fires in the North and South Towers burned only 102 and 56 minutes, respectively, before they collapsed. And neither fire, unlike the Philadelphia and Caracas fires, 
or hot enough to break windows. Second, total collapses of steel frame high-rise buildings have never, either before or after 9-11, been brought about by fire alone or fire plus externally caused structural damage. The collapse of Building 7 has been recognized as especially difficult to explain. It was not hit by a plane, so the explanation has to rely solely on fire, and yet because there was no jet fuel to get a big fire started, this building had fires on only two or three floors, according to several witnesses and all photographic evidence. FEMA admitted that the best theory it could come up with for this collapse had only a low probability of occurrence. The 9-11 Commission report it implicitly admitted that it could not explain the collapse of this building by not even mentioning it. <laughs> the NIST report, which could not claim that the fireproofing had gotten knocked off the steel of this building, has yet to offer an explanation as to why it collapsed. And NIST, like the 9-11 Commission, evidently does not want you asking why Building 7 collapsed even though it was not hit by a plane. On its website, it says that one of its objectives is to determine why and how World Trade Center buildings 1, 2, and 7 collapsed after the initial impact of the aircraft, thereby implying that Building 7, like the Twin Towers, was also hit by a plane. In any case, a third problem with the official account of the collapses of these three buildings is that all prior and subsequent collapses, total collapses of steel frame high-rises, have been caused by explosives in the procedure known as controlled demolition. This problem is made even more severe by the fact that the collapses of these three buildings manifested many features of the most difficult type of controlled demolition known as implosion. I will mention seven such features. First, the collapses began suddenly. Steel, if weakened by fire, would gradually begin to sag. But as one can see from the videos available on the web, all three buildings are completely motionless up to the moment they begin to collapse. Second, if these huge buildings had toppled over, they would have caused enormous death and destruction in lower Manhattan but they came straight down. This straight down collapse is the whole point of controlled implosion, which only a few companies in the world are qualified to pull off. Third, these buildings collapsed at virtually free fall speed, which means that the lower floors, with all their steel and concrete, were offering virtually no resistance. Fourth, as mentioned earlier, these collapses were total collapses resulting in piles of rubble only a few stories high. This means that the enormous steel columns in the core of each building had to be broken into rather short segments, which is what explosives do. Fifth, great quantities of molten steel were produced, which means that the steel had been heated up to several thousand degrees. And witnesses during the cleanup reported that sometimes when a piece of steel was lifted out of the rubble, it was dripping, molted, metal. Sixth, according to many firefighters, medical workers, journalists, and World Trade Center employees, many explosions went off both before and during the collapses. For example, Fire Captain Dennis Tardil, speaking of the South Tower, said, I hear an explosion and I look up. It is as if the building is being imploded from the top floor down, one after another. Boom, boom, boom. Firefighter Richard Minasinski said, it seemed like on television when they blow up these buildings, it seemed like it was going all the way around like a belt, all these explosions. Thanks to the release in August of 2005 of the oral histories recorded by the Fire Department of New York shortly after 9-11, dozens of testimony of this type are now available. I have published an essay on them, which is included in a forthcoming book on 9-11 and Christian faith along with a lecture on the destruction of the World Trade Center, which I am now summarizing. A seventh feature of controlled implosions is the production of large quantities of dust. In the case of the Twin Towers, virtually everything except the steel, all the concrete, the desks, the computers, was pulverized into very tiny dust particles. The official story cannot explain one 
let alone all seven of these features, at least, as Hoffman and Jones point out, without violating several basic laws of physics. But the controlled demolition theory easily explains all these features. These findings are inconsistent with the idea that al-Qaeda terrorists were responsible. Foreign terrorists could not have gotten access to those buildings for all the hours it would have taken to plant the explosives. Also, al-Qaeda terrorists probably would not have had the courtesy to make sure that the buildings came straight down rather than toppling over. <laughs> the terrorists working for the Bush-Cheney administration, by contrast, could have gotten such access, especially given the fact that Marvin Bush and Wirt Walker III, the president's brother and cousin respectively, were principals of the company in charge of security for the World Trade Center. Another relevant fact is that the evidence was destroyed. An examination of the building's steel beams and columns could have shown whether explosives had been used to slice them, but virtually all of the steel was removed before it could be properly investigated, then put on ships to Asia to be melted down. It is usually a federal offense to remove anything from a crime scene, even a matchbook, but here the removal of over 100 tons of steel, the biggest destruction of evidence in history, was carried out under the supervision of federal officials. Evidence was also apparently planted. The passport of one of the hijackers on Flight 11 was allegedly found in the rubble. <laughs> <laughs> Having survived the, the fiery inferno, I'm not making this up. passport had survived the, not only the fiery inferno from, caused by the uh, airplane, but also whatever caused everything else in these buildings to be pulverized into tiny dust. <laughs> the magic passport. <laughs> to sum up, the idea that U U.S. officials have given a satisfactory or even close to satisfactory explanation of the collapse of the World Trade Center is a myth. And these officials have implicitly admitted this by refusing to engage in rational debate about it. Michael Newman, a spokesman for NIST, reportedly said during a recent interview that none of the NIST scientists would participate in any public debate with scientists who reject their report. When Newman was asked why NIST would avoid public debate if it had confidence in its report, he replied, because there is no winning in such debates. <laughs> in the same interview, Newman had compared people who reject the government's account of the collapses with people who believe in Bigfoot and a flat earth. And yet he fears that his scientists would not be able to show up these fools in a public debate. In any case, I come now to the final myth, which is myth number nine, there is no doubt that Flight 77, under the control of Al-Qaeda hijacker Hani Han Ewer, struck the Pentagon. There are, in fact, many reasons to doubt this claim. We have, in the first place, reasons to doubt that the aircraft that hit the Pentagon was under the control of Hani Han Ewer. For one thing, the aircraft, before striking the Pentagon, reportedly executed a 270-degree downward spiral, and yet Hani Han Ewer was known as a terrible pilot who could not safely fly even a small plane. Russ Wittenberg, who flew large commercial airliners for 35 years after serving in Vietnam as a fighter pilot, says that it would have been totally impossible for an amateur who couldn't even fly a Cessna to maneuver the jetliner in such a highly professional manner. Moreover, as a result of that very difficult maneuver, the Pentagon's west wing was struck but terrorists brilliant enough to get through the U.S. military's defense system would have known that this was the worst place to strike for several reasons. The West Wing had been reinforced, so the damage was less severe than a strike anywhere else would have been. This wing was still being renovated, so relatively few people were there. A strike anywhere else would have killed thousands rather than 125. And the Secretary of Defense and all the top brass, whom terrorists would presumably have wanted to kill, were in the East Wing. Why would an Al-Qaeda pilot have executed a very difficult maneuver to hit the West Wing 
when he could have simply crashed into the roof of the East Wing. A second major problem with the official story. There are reasons to believe that the Pentagon was struck only because officials at the Pentagon wanted it to be struck. For one thing, Flight 77 allegedly, after making a U-turn in the Midwest, flew back to Washington undetected for 40 minutes. And yet the U.S. military, which by then clearly would have known that hijacked airliners were being used as weapons, has the best radar systems in the world, one of which, it brags, does not miss anything occurring in North American airspace. The idea that a large airliner could have slipped through is absurd. Also, the Pentagon is surely the best defended building on the planet. It is not only within the P-56A restricted airspace that extends 17 miles in all directions from the Washington Monument, but also within the P-56B airspace, the three-mile ultra-restricted restric zone above the White House, the Capitol, and the Pentagon. The P Pentagon is only a few miles from Andrews Air Force Base, which has at least three squadrons with fire, fighter jets on alert at all times. The claim by the 9-11 Commission report that no fighters were on alert the morning of 9-11 is wholly implausible, as I have explained in my book on this subject. The Pentagon, moreover, is reportedly protected by batteries of surface-to-air missiles. So if any aircraft without a U.S. military's transponder were to enter the Pentagon's airspace, it would be shot down. So even if the aircraft that hit the Pentagon was Flight 77, it could have succeeded only because officials in the Pentagon turned off their missiles as well as ordering the fighters from Andrews to stand down. A third major problem with the official story is that there is considerable evidence it could not have been Flight 77 because it was not a Boeing 757. For one thing, the strike on the Pentagon, unlike the strikes on the Twin Towers, did not create a detectable seismic signal. Also, according to several witnesses and many people who have studied the available photographs, both the damage and the debris were inconsistent with a strike by a large airliner. That issue, however, is too complex to discuss here, as is the issue of what should be infer inferred from conflicting eyewitness testimony. Deferring those topics to another time, I will conclude by pointing out that the suspicion that the Pentagon was not struck by a 757, as the government claims, is supported by the fact that evidence was destroyed. Shortly after the strike, government agents picked up debris and carried it off. Shortly thereafter, the entire lawn was covered with dirt and gravel so that any remaining forensic evidence was literally covered up. Also, the videos from security cameras on the nearby Sitco gas station and Sheraton Hotel, which would show what really hit the Pentagon, were immediately confiscated by agents of the FBI, and the Department of Justice has to this day refused to release them. If these videos would prove that the Pentagon was really hit by a 757, most of us would assume the government would release them. To conclude, it would seem for many reasons that the official story of 9-11, which has served as a religious myth in the intervening years, is a myth in the pejorative sense of a story that does not correspond with reality. One sign of a, that a story is a myth in this sense, I have pointed out, is that it cannot be rationally defended. The official story has never been publicly defended by any member of NIST or of the 9-11 Commission or of the Bush administration. After Charlie Sheen had made public his skepticism about the official story, CNN's Showbiz Tonight wanted to have a debate about the points he had raised between a representative of the government and a representative of 911truth.org. But the report, uh, producers reportedly could find no member of the government willing to appear on the show. In this unwillingness of the government to appear on an entertainment show, to answer questions raised by an actor, we would seem to have the clearest possible sign that the government's story is myth, not reality. <laughs> if so, we must demand that the government immediately cease implementing the policies that have been warranted by the official account of 9-11. For this story, 
serving as a national religious myth, has been used to justify two wars, which have cost many tens of thousands of deaths, to start a more general war on radical Islam, in which Muslims around the world are now considered guilty until proven innocent, to annul and violate civil rights, and to increase our military spending, which was already greater than all the spending of the rest of the world together, and yet now we've increased it by several more billions of dollars, much of this to, uh, being used to put weapons in space. Congress needs to put the implementation of these policies on hold until there is a truly independent investigation carried out by qualified individuals who are not members of the very circles that, if 9-11 truly was a false flag operation, planned it, carried it out, and then covered it up. Thank you very much for your attention. Several questions, in fact, uh, related to your own safety. How concerned are you? Not, because um, either they're going to take me out or leave me alone. If they leave me alone, I get to enjoy my old age and write my systematic theology. If they take me out, my 9-11 books go to the number one spot on the <laughs> <laughs> uh, So it's a win-win situation. Do you think you're being monitored, asks one questioner? Do you think we have some FBI agents in the room? Gosh, I hope so. <laughs> because uh, I've been told that there are many people inside who, who would like to tell their story. And, and, uh, but they know it'll be very dangerous for them if they do, and certainly if they let anybody know in advance that they are going to. But what we're faced here with is uh, so humongous. I mean, the very future, not only of our country, but of our planet, is at stake. So I would appeal to some people within the military, within the FBI, within any branch of government who knows the truth and can really be a whistleblower, to come forward, take the risk, uh, even at the risk of your own life, for the good of the world. One questioner says, it still seems difficult for me to believe that the members of the 9-11 Commission, Democrats included, could be so managed by one person so as to hide all this evidence. Huh? How, how could that happen here? These people were carefully selected. Uh, Lee Hamilton, for example, had experience on uh, previous uh, investigations. And I'm not an expert on this, but uh, you might bring Peter Dale Scott to talk about this and the role that Hamilton played in the Iran-Contra uh, investigation. And um, again, in my second book, The 9-11 Commission Report, Omissions and Distortions, in the final section, I discussed the various conflicts of interest that were in the commission. And furthermore, remember, uh, the commissioners you saw on TV, uh, they didn't do the work of the commission. Uh, the, the staff of about 80 that Zelikow ran did the work. And Zelikow, as I say, decided which topics were worth investigating. So for example, when Jamie Gorelick was asked, why didn't you talk about the war games? She said, we were told those weren't important, so we didn't look into them. Can you imagine how many things they were told were not important? Uh, there was no investigation at all of any of the aspects of the story that contradict, of any of the evidence that contradicts the official story. Commission did not uh, say, okay, what's the most plausible theory of what happened? They just accepted the official story and looked at evidence relevant to that. They didn't even raise the question of this alternative scenario 
and ask what kind of evidence there was for that. Now people say, look at the, oh, what a scholarly book. Look at all those notes in the back. You can go through all those notes. The first sign of a work of scholarship is a review of the relevant evidence. You will not find my books or any other critics of the 9-11 uh, official story are books or articles or websites mentioned in there. It's a total uh, blackout of all contrary information. Solicitor General Olson's wife was on the plane that hit the Pentagon. Do we know that? We all assume. We were all taught, of course, Barbara Olson was on there because she made a, a cell phone or an air phone call to her husband, Ted Olson. How do we know that? Only, only we have Ted Olson's word for it. There is no confirmation that we've been given of any investigation of uh, the, the uh, phone records uh, that suggest that such a call was even made. The bigger question here, you know, it would be, well, then, if it wasn't Flight 77, what happened to Flight 77 and all the people on it? Well, there are many possible theories as to that, and uh, I don't happen to have a particular theory, but there are all sorts of explanations. One was uh, suggested on 9-11 itself that an airliner had crashed near the uh, Kentucky-Ohio uh, border. Jane Garvey took that very seriously. Later it was said, oh, no, that was false, but maybe that was true. We don't know. There are many other things that could have happened to, uh, to the flight. So my focus has been not on what really happened that day, but just on the many, many reasons to hold that the official story is not true. And what we need is an investigation. I would love to know where Barbara Olson uh, went. I would love to know what really happened and, and, uh, uh, with the Pentagon and with the World Trade Center. Uh, what we need is a genuine investigation. You put people under oath. You use subpoenas. You use lie detector tests. You do all the things you do in a real criminal investigation, all the things that were not done in this investigation. This investigation was a total farce. The next question is about your proposal for an official investigation. And he asks, or she asks, if this is conducted as you recommend at this investigation, how could it be implemented in light and view of the obstacles that will be placed by the administration? There are many possibilities. One would be a uh, uh, citizen's uh, investigation. Um, get some very distinguished uh, citizens, uh, you know, of the Jimmy Carter type, that stature. Get some uh, real scientists who are not on the payroll and whose companies are not dependent upon government contracts. Um, that's possible. Now, that could be done within our country. It could be done within North America, our country and uh, uh, Canada in particular. It could be done in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we hear tell that Venezuela is getting very interested in uh, carrying out an investigation. Um, <laughs> there's been talk about a, uh, a European or an international commission. Um, uh, I hope there are some people in this room today who might have the vision and the wherewithal uh, and the energy to organize and perhaps fund uh, such a commission. Uh, by the way, one other thing that would, uh, you know, I mean, it would be, the obvious thing would be, it would be good if Congress would do this. But, of course, they did their little joint inquiry, uh, and then they realized they really couldn't do it. They got intimidated by the FBI and they passed it on then to the 9-11 Commission, oh, which did a worse job than the uh, Joint Inquiry did. Uh, so I mean, we learned a few interesting uh, real facts from the Joint Inquiry. So um, thus far, there's, there, there are no signs that Congress will act whether to uh, do their own investigation or appoint a special prosecutor. That would be uh, a way to do this. Um, but it's, uh, there, there are a few signs that, th that that will happen. So it'll probably be more fruitful to focus on uh, some sort of citizens committee, national or, or international. The 
Pearl Harbor attack, there was a real enemy, and if that was facilitated, well, there was a real enemy to chase. Um, is it your opinion that there is now a new real enemy? <laughs> this is the big difference between the new Pearl Harbor and the old Pearl Harbor. Um, Roosevelt believed the United States had to get into World War II. Um, Robert, uh, is it Stinnett or Stinnett? Stinnett. Stinnett. Does he happen to be here? I think he's right, and uh, in the meantime, some more people have written uh, evidence uh, about this. If you look at uh, Stephen Snigowski, uh, Google him, and you'll find uh, even more information about the original Pearl Harbor. In any case, um, um, let us assume this is true, that Stinnett and these others are right, uh, that Roosevelt um, uh, knew that Pearl Harbor was coming and even, uh, uh, to some extent, maneuvered the Japanese into the attack. And roughly uh, 3,000 people were killed, uh, mainly military people in this case. Um, many people looking back would say, you know, 80% of the people, uh, that's the, those are the numbers we get, were against getting in the war, and that Roosevelt uh, believed uh, emphatically that it was necessary um, uh, to protect American interests, no doubt, that was number one, but also for the good of the world as a whole to stop the uh, uh, Japanese uh, and fascist alliance. Um, in the present case, we have a fabricated enemy. Some of you have seen the power of nightmares. Um, gives an inkling about that, not, nothing like the whole story, but some very important information. Um, the question about what it was and, and certainly what is the present relation between the Bush administration and Al-Qaeda, uh, I don't know. But there is, there is reason to believe that the working relationship they had during the Afghanistan war uh, was never severed. So if that's the case, this is completely an artificial enemy. Now, many people say, okay, they were working together at one time, and then uh, Osama bin Laden got really ticked off at us and decided to attack us. Um, that's possible, but it's also possible that that's all part of the official story, particularly when you hear that uh, Osama was in the uh, hospital in Dubai being treated by an American doctor and visited by the local CIA agent in the summer of 2001 when Osama bin Laden was already supposedly America's most wanted uh, criminal. Since so many people have an emotional investment in what they believe America to be and stand for in the world, do you think we as a people and a country have any substantial hope or interest in reconciling the truth with our own self-image? That is an excellent question, and it really gets to the crux of the matter for many people and the difficulty of getting the story out. Um, I have a, uh, a theological friend in uh, the UK who uh, early on said, well, he read my book, and the evidence is completely persuasive, but he just refuses to believe it because he says there just must be some end to uh, American duplicity. Now, that's a different attitude than the one we're talking about here, that is, Americans themselves. I, mean, I grew up a patriot. I think most of us probably grew up as patriots. And patriotism meant believing your country was good. This is the myth that has been inculcated, that America always does right, or if we do wrong, it's just a mistake or a few bad apples. So to believe that the system has become so corrupt that criminals willing to do this sort of thing are in charge of the White House and the various uh, branches, the FBI, CIA, and uh, Justice Department, and so on, um, and that the Congress is either complicit or too cowardly to do anything, and uh, it still remains a, an open question, I think, about the Supreme Court. So th these are very troubling thoughts. And, and, and one person uh, wrote in response to uh, a story about me, the only 
positive uh, story that's been appeared in the mainstream press about my work was in the LA Times uh, magazine, Sunday magazine. And someone wrote in saying, well, the evidence is completely persuasive that, that Griffin presents, but that America will not believe it because it just runs too contrary to our myth and the idea of this kind of uh, conspiracy and cover-up is just too frightening and so we will find some way not to believe it. And I'm afraid that may be the truth, but I'm actually more optimistic than that. I think the people can stand to know the truth, want to know the truth, and will rally when there is an opportunity. Something came to my mind the other day when we saw Andrew Card resign um, and or jump off the sinking ship, whatever you want to say. I've always thought, looking at that very, very famous footage of him bending over and whispering into the ear of President Bush in that Florida classroom, I've always thought that what he said was, everything's going according to plan, sir. <laughs> It's the only thing that makes sense looking at his faith, the Bush's faith. How do you account for the fact that there are so many holes in the official story? Surely they would have planned the cover story while planning the attack. Do they want us to the un uncover the truth for some other reason? That's a good question, and I devoted quite a bit of space to it in the new Pearl Harbor because I point out there are so many things that are just so obviously problematic. Uh, uh, but one, one answer is that, uh, you know, when you look at the war in Iraq, these guys are not geniuses. <laughs> is anything known about the placement of explosives in the World Trade Center buildings and their ignition? Both Jim Hoffman, whom I believe is here, and uh, Stephen Jones, a uh, physicist at BYU, whose, uh, I think uh, there was a uh, film uh, with him in it, and uh, he has now, he has written a, a, a lecture which has gotten a lot of circulation called Why Indeed Did the uh, World Trade Center Buildings Collapse? Uh, both Hoffman and Jones have discussed this issue. There are plausible scenarios, not very difficult actually to figure out, as to where the explosives would have to be placed in order to slice, uh, say, you know, all the 47 uh, cord columns. And evidently it wouldn't take an enormous amount, a uh, number of explosives. Uh, Jones at least suggests uh, to take quite a, quite a bit fewer than I had originally thought so that it wouldn't literally take thousands of hours to, uh, to plant all these. What about the flight that crashed in Pennsylvania? Several of my family members work for the NSA and they say it was shot down. I left 93 out tonight because I thought you might want to get home before midnight. <laughs> um, oh, a man appreciates that. Good. Um, but uh, I devoted quite a bit of time to it, both in the New Pearl Harbor and in the uh, second book. It certainly does appear that uh, uh, the U.S. military shot it down. I mean, there's, there's an enormous amount of evidence that it did. And it appears that uh, one of the motives for lying about when Cheney went down below is to make it appear that he could have po not possibly given the shoot-down order. That is, everybody knows it was Cheney who gave the shoot-down order. Now, there's been the controversy, did he get the permission from the president? Uh, uh, and, of course, they say he did, and the, even the 9-11 Commission expressed skepticism about that. But that aside, uh, everybody knows that Cheney gave the order. So then the question is, when did he give the order? Every story prior to the 9-11 Commission report said that he gave it several minutes before uh, 10 o'clock. And uh, Flight uh, 93 
was shot down at 10.03, according to the government's theory, a little later, according to uh, seismic records. Uh, Richard Clark, for example, had said in his book, Against All Enemies, that he was amazed when he asked for shoot-down authorization how quickly it came from Cheney. And uh, Clark gives the impression it came about uh, 9.45. And he says definitely before the, pla the uh, president's plane took off at uh, 9.50. So, and then we have reports that uh, uh, jets were sent by the head of uh, Needs, uh, NORADs in the, in the northeast section, and told to shoot the flight down. We have a, re a pilot who said he heard a rumor from his other uh, people in the military that the military had shot down an aircraft. People at the, at the site gave all sorts of evidence that would suggest the, the plane had been downed uh, probably by a missile and so on. But the 9-11 Commission said that Cheney didn't get down to the underground bunker uh, until almost 10 o'clock. And then by the time he gave the shoot down auth authorization, it was after 10-10. So that at least seven minutes had gone by uh, after the flight had already crashed. So the logic is, Cheney, the, the, the military could not possibly have shot it down. But this is one of the most obvious lies in the commission report. Um, everything, including Cheney himself, indicated that, that he was down there long before that. And it's just amazing, um, or it ought to be amazing, that our mainstream press won't even point out that most obvious lie in the commission's report. What do you think is the best response to the phrase conspiracy theory? Well, the quickest one is that the government's theory was the original conspiracy theory about 9-11. <laughs> and it's very interesting that both President Bush and Philip Zelikow used the identical words, telling people, Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. But it's interesting to think about... Uh, uh, you know, what would be an outrageous conspiracy theory? It can't just be any conspiracy theory, since the government's theory is a conspiracy theory, according to which 19 Arab Muslims, under the inspiration of uh, Osama bin Laden, conspired to, to do all these things. So uh, what's an outrageous one? Well, it, you know, if you think about these things in terms of the philosophy of science, a, uh, you, have, you know, you have good theories and bad theories. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a theory, you know, uh, uh, quantum theory is considered rather respectable, and yet it's a theory. So, uh, um, and there's nothing wrong with conspiracy theories. We all believe hundreds of conspiracy theories. Every day you read the newspaper, read about, you know, it's just when two or three people conspire in secret to do something immoral or illegal, that's a conspiracy. And so our newspapers are full of those, from robbing the uh, local 7-Eleven to... Uh, Enron conspiring to uh, cheat uh, its investors. Um, so there must be something that makes something an outrageous conspiracy theory. Well, in uh, philosophy of science, a good theory is one that can take account of all the relevant facts in a self-consistent way. A bad theory is one that is inconsistent with some of the relevant facts. An outrageous theory would want be one that is inconsistent with all the relevant facts, <laughs> and that's the official theory about 9-11. Why have none of the four or possibly eight black boxes on the hijacked planes been revealed to the public? I think that was a rhetorical question, so we can probably just move on. Uh, uh, these black boxes uh, could just reveal uh, all sorts of things that contradict the official story. So we're not going to see these black boxes any more than we're going to see the videos uh, from the Pentagon. Please comment on the allegations of war games in progress on 9-11 involving simulated hijackings as confirmed by Rumsfeld to Representative Maxine Waters. People involved in the 9-11 truth movement uh, tend to, I mean, 
some of us are generalists, but even generalists have to specialize in certain things. And I have followed the discussion of the war games uh, with interest. And uh, uh, at the time Mike Rupert wrote his book, I think he was talking about four war games going on. And now uh, uh, Paul Thompson and Matt Everett have suggested, uh, I believe they're up to nine now. I have not uh, uh, thus far been convinced that, uh, that we should say that what happened on 9-11 was not a stand down but was rather confusion caused by these war games and, and uh, planes being out of town and all these blips on the computers and so on. Um, it's possible, but I haven't seen the need for it yet, and so I'm still just an old-fashioned stand-down guy. Why is the theologian one of the primary speakers for this cause? Do you feel do you see any religious or spiritual implications for 9-11, and what are they? Uh, why is a theologian speaking about this? I didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> what we theologians are supposed to be doing is trying to imagine and speak about the world from the divine point of view. And if the religions of the world are basically correct, the divine is the creator and lover of all peoples, in fact, all creatures, and cares about the good of the world, the long-term good of the world, and wouldn't want people producing um, nuclear wars that would decimate all life on the planet wouldn't want the global warming to continue, continue after 30 years after we've known about it, 35 years now, about the ecological crisis, um, wouldn't want all these things. So I'm convinced that this administration, as was said earlier tonight, is the most dangerous administration we have ever had for the future of this country. and the future of the world. And if, uh, if trying to save God's planet is not a religious issue, I wouldn't know what was. Thank you for the question. There are only a few demolition companies that could have pulled off a controlled demolition of the towers. Have they been investigated and individual workers sought out who might have been involved in the packing or placing of the explosives beforehand? Of course not. <laughs> Control Demolition, that company, which is one of the few companies in the world authorized to do controlled implosions, was brought in to do the cleanup for the World Trade Center. <laughs> I understand uh, made quite a tidy profit on it. Tidy, not tiny. Um, it's very interesting, Mark Loiseau, the president, did an interview recently in New Scientist magazine, and uh, some very damning stuff in there inadvertently. He explains that uh, to, to make a building come down in that way, straight down so no other buildings are destroyed, it takes enormous planning. He says he spends you know, hundreds of hours when it's a big building, uh, scoping it out, taking pictures, going back again. He says the explosives have to be placed just right and in precisely the right order in order to bring the building straight down. But then he says, oh, but of course the uh, World Trade Center buildings were brought down by fire. <laughs> I agree with all you said. What do we do now? A plan a revolution. B, nonviolent resistance like Gandhi. C, move to another country. <laughs> they have the president, Congress, courts, military, CIA, NSA, Homeland Security, industry, media, etc. We have what? 
Well, we have each other and we have the truth, for starters. And of the three options, I would say A and B, both of them, plan the revolution and nonviolent resistance. I gave a talk recently uh, in Santa Barbara, which was a, uh, the, uh, actually the first talk I gave specifically as a Christian theologian speaking on this issue to fellow Christians. And uh, in that talk, as well as in a, uh, uh, the book I mentioned that is coming out on 9-11 and Christian faith, I suggest that uh, what we need within the uh, Christian church in this country is an anti-imperial movement. And now tonight I would expand that and say that Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, ethical humanists, human beings should form an anti-imperial movement. Because that's what, as I tried to make clear, 9-11 was all about, a means to increase the empire. And so we do need a revolution a nonviolent revolution against American imperialism before it's too late. After being told by several people that uh, I needed to look into this because it looked like the government was uh, complicit, and for a while I would look at possible websites and so on, and I didn't find it convincing. And finally I found Paul Thompson's work, uh, which has now been published as a book called The Terror Timeline. And it had an amazing amount of material drawn from strictly mainline sources that uh, simply contradicted the official account. So I started reading more and more stuff, and I read uh, Nafi's Ahmed's book, The War on Freedom. Uh, I read uh, then Terry Mason's book on Pentagate and 9-11, uh, The Big Lie. And then I did learn more about what was going on on the Internet. I never had been an Internet person. And I saw that a lot of people had been working on this for a long time, but most of them were people who would never be able to get a book published. And I thought, well, since I've published about 25 books before, maybe I would have a shot at it. Uh, even then, it was much more difficult than I uh, thought. Uh, most publishers uh, simply wouldn't uh, respond to my letters. But uh, I kept at it till I found uh, brave little Interlink uh, books, which was willing to do it. And uh, so, f first of all, I just thought it was a duty, the fact that this enormous amount of research had been done and that it certainly uh, presented a credible case that people needed to uh, know about and that maybe I was in position to bring that to the public. So for the most part, the new Pearl Harbor has uh, hardly any original material in it. It's mainly just an organization of work that other people has done and uh, a presentation of it in a fairly brief and fairly readable uh, way. So that was the primary motivation. Certainly, uh, I was also motivated by these other concerns. As a, as a theologian, um, I'm committed to the, to the good of the whole, the good of the whole universe, the good of the whole earth. And if it looks like there is a gang that has gotten control of our government and our purse strings to use it for very uh, selfish and imperialistic purposes, uh, then that needs to be exposed. There has been uh, a long history. Um, we're sitting here in uh, California. We stole this from the Mexicans um, by uh, deliberately fabricating an incident um, where we were in on their property and then they were 
they were accused of shedding American blood on American property. Um, the congressman at the time named Abraham Lincoln called this a shameless lie. Um, likewise, uh, when we took over Cuba, the Philippines, and Hawaii, and a few other islands, Puerto Rico and Guam and so on, um, there was a, a battleship there in the uh, harbor just uh, put down there for nobody knows quite why. And there was a big explosion on the battleship. This, of course, the battleship Maine, and everybody knows the slogan, Remember the Maine, the hell was Spain. And um, it's still a mystery exactly what happened, but we certainly used it as an incident and accused Spain falsely of having blown up the Maine. It's the last thing Spain would have done. Likewise, the war in the Philippines uh, the following year was started by an incident that the... Uh, the soldier in charge admitted that uh, he was told to, to start the war as an incident and so on. And more, more recently, people know about the Gulf of Tonkin, that those events never happened, which uh, were really when the Vietnam War went full scale. So there is a long history, and there's also the famous or notorious uh, Operations Northwoods document. When uh, General Eisenhower was just about to leave office, he desperately wanted to invade Cuba to get rid of Fidel Castro, but time ran out. The plan, the plan uh, passed over to uh, uh, President Kennedy, but then there was the little Bay of uh, Pigs uh, fiasco. Kennedy took Cuban planning away from the CIA, gave it to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They came in with this plan, which would involve killing American citizens and blaming the Cubans as a pretext to invade Cuba. Kennedy turned it down. Another president might have accepted it. But those uh, documents have now been uh, published, and uh, many people know about them through James Bamford's work, um, House of Secrets, about the National Security Agency. So there is a long history of planning uh, fabricating incidents. Um, there's a whole question about uh, the original Pearl Harbor, which I don't go into in my book, but certainly uh, Robert Snett has made a very strong claim for the uh, old idea, but uh, he gives much more evidence for it, that uh, we knew full well that those attacks were coming, and in fact that uh, we actually squeezed the Japanese until they, they, they believed they had no choice but to make that preemptive attack. So yes, there is a very long history. So um, most, many people who reject the idea that there could be any kind of conspiracy do it on an a priori basis. They just say, they say, well, our government would never do such a thing. Our military, they're so protective of human rights and uh, the precious sacredness of every human life, they would never do anything like this. Well, people just need to learn the history and realize that 3,000 lives taken on 9-11, in terms of the kind of cost-benefit analysis that the military is trained to do and that the CIA is trained to do, this was a very, uh, what they would call, uh, high cost-benefit uh, operation. When you look at um, Vietnam, that enterprise, you're talking about tens of thousands of Americans killed after we knew the war was futile, after we knew we could not win, and we were simply fighting to save American credibility. Tens of thousands were sacrificed. So to kill 3,000 on 9-11 Given that kind of mindset that thinks in those terms, this was a, not a bad price to pay. Well, the immediate thing, of course, is if you uh, become convinced you've got criminals uh, in the White House, uh, get rid of them. Uh, more long term, we need to overcome uh, plutocracy. Plutocracy is... Uh, Rather, where a democracy is rich, is a rule by the people, of the people, for the people. Plutocracy is a rule by the rich, of the rich, for the rich. 
And we have a system now in which the richest 1 to 5 percent of the country uh, calls the shots for America and therefore calls the shots for the world. So we need to, um, this may sound simplistic, but the, the biggest single step we could take would be to get rid of all private financing of elections. That's why these politicians um, cannot tell the truth. That's why they can't buck the corporations. That's why we only get rich people or people who are sponsored by rich corporations uh, who can run for national office. So we need public financing so that honest people um, can, uh, can get in the government and uh, pass laws and then we can get honest people in the White House who will execute those laws. Uh, so I would say that would be the, the next thing. And thirdly, um, work for global democracy and in my forthcoming books I'll be uh, describing the reasons for that.